Hi, I'm Bob Tabor. In this module, we're going to talk about Azure Storage Blobs. We're going to give it the same treatment that we've given tables and queues up to this point, where we're going to start by talking about what we already know about blobs and then move on and expand from there. So previously, I said that the word blob actually is an acronym of sorts that stands for a binary large object. Blobs have been around for a very long time. When you think of a blob, think of files. Uh, that are being stored inside of some data store. So uh, in the past, you could create a blob in a SQL Server table and you could put an image or a document or whatever inside of there. And this is the same sort of thing where you're actually storing uh, the bytes that represent a file inside of some storage mechanism, in this case, a container. Uh, so there's many practical uses inside and outside of Azure. Inside of Azure, we've already seen from the previous uh, uh, the uh, the previous course on Azure websites, how it's been used. Uh, additionally, it'll be used in virtual machines, which we'll look at in the next course, but we've seen it used for log files, for CDN or origins, uh, an origin folder, and for backing up, for log files, things of that nature, okay? And um, the, uh, the taxonomy is pretty easy to understand. You have the account, the storage account itself, uh, an account can have multiple containers, and inside of each container you can have uh, multiple blobs. And a blob can be of any file type and just about any file size. Uh, there is a maximum amount, but I doubt that we'll ever reach it. Uh, that can actually be stored in a blob container. And so most of the time, there well, there's two different types of blobs. The first time a type of blob is a block blob, and the maximum size of a block blob is 200 gigabytes. So just think of just your typical files on a file system. Images, uh, video, music files, documents of any sort, executable files, whatever you want to store up there, you can store up there. And that's what you're typically going to be using as a block blob. But there's also something called a page blob. And that's useful whenever you're going to um, write or edit or change something about that file frequently. Uh, you can change ranges of bytes inside of a blob by using a page blob, and that will store actually up to one terabyte. So I think this is the scenario where you're using it to store log files, and you need to constantly write and add data to a log file. That'll be stored as, I believe, a page blob. Uh, and we've already noted this when we were looking at the tools for Vi Azure Tools for Visual Studio that blobs are accessible using a URL uh, where you have the storage account .blob .core .windows .net slash the container name then slash the blob. And also we looked at uh, in that same module how blobs can be in folders or subfolders underneath the container. And I said at that time that really there's no notion of some physical separation of folders and subfolders. It's really just kind of like um, appending to the actual name of the blob. It gives you some sense of organization. It can be represented as folders in a user interface, but uh, all the blobs will be just stored uh, physically under the same container. So uh, when we think about blobs and we think about files, we're going to be uh, utilizing those files in some way. Uh, we're going to upload them and then they're going to be available to applications or to users uh, or, or something or somebody. And so there's a couple of different ways that you, you can secure blobs. The first is obviously through the primary and the secondary management key, which you use to manage all resources within Microsoft Azure. The next is through uh, a series of uh, settings or one setting that you put on a container. As you're creating a new container, you can choose one of three different settings, either private uh, or public blob or public container. And let's talk about the difference between them. The private is the default uh, container access value. So that means only this, uh, this container is only visible by the owner. So you have to be logged in as the owner in order to actually work with the contents of of that, uh, of that container and work with that blob. Uh, you can make the individual blobs available uh, for read access, but the user will not be able to see anything about other files in the same blob or any information about the container itself. Uh, and then finally, public containers, just full read access for uh, both the blob and the container and all metadata associated with, with both of those. Uh, and then also, uh, you may want a public container. You may want people outside of your organization to access those files. However, you might want to have some restrictions on uh, how long a given hyperlink is, is usable. So the scenario that I put out there before is, and I use this myself uh, for my own website, 
is that I make my video files downloadable by members of my own website, but I give them a link that expires after 10 minutes. So even if they share that on Twitter or they share that out on their own webpage somehow, um, my exposure is small. I'm not going to be feeding millions of people unless they happen to jump in on that link within that 10 minute window of time. So basically, in order to enable that, there's some, a technology called shared access signature. This works for tables and queues too. I just don't have the scenario in my mind where I would need it for that, but you can use it for that as well. And basically it gives restricted rights on a given blob for a specific interval of time. And so again, the user can click it, can start the download process, and that hyperlink will no longer be active then after a certain amount of time. So those are the different ways that you can secure the blobs, um, uh, allowing management, allowing container access, and then also giving people outside your organization access, but only for uh, a limited period of time. And then finally, I want to point you to this, uh, this shortcut that'll take you to the how to work with Azure Storage Blobs on Azure's own documentation. Uh, just like we talked about with the cues and the tables, that's probably the best place to go to learn all of the basic usage of a blob from a software development perspective. So we're going to look at that in the next module uh, specifically uh, in more detail. But then beyond those basics, there are also several things that I wanna demonstrate in subsequent modules. Uh, how to control access, just that'll be pretty simple. We'll just show the different ways that you can control access to a file. We're gonna look at leasing blobs for updating. So say that I did wanna make a change inside of a blob. Maybe I'm gonna write a different line to it or something. I'm gonna to need to lease the blob for a period of time so that somebody else can't come in and start writing. Another process can't start writing to that same blob while I have a lock on it essentially, uh, at least for a specific period of time. And then finally, I'll demonstrate how to use that shared access signature um, uh, technology for blobs as well. Okay, we'll see you in the next module. Thank you. In this module, we'll take a look at the basics of blob storage, just how to write to blob storage, how to read and download items from blob storage. And uh, that's pretty much it. But we're going to keep it very simple as we, uh, as we dip our toe in the shallow end of the pool. Uh, I would recommend that you take a look at this document, How to Use Blob Storage from .NET. It's the, uh, the first tutorial on their documentation for blob storage. In fact, uh, you can see I've even pulled some of my uh, my content from this page in previous in the previous module and uh, I use this as the basis for a project that I created let's go ahead and close this down called blob basics and basically what it'll do and I just kind of walk through the script here the storyline uh, this will demonstrate how to connect to a blob storage service how to get a a handle on a blob container, how to upload files to that blob container, how to get a list of the files that are in the blob container, how to download files from the blob container, and then how to delete files in the container. So that's really just the, the absolute basics, right? Uh, and some of these things will look familiar. I mean, we've done things like this with the storage client before, um, getting a reference to the, uh, to the storage account, creating a, a, a client, that allows us to get to a container using a container reference. If the container doesn't already exist, go ahead and create it. Uh, at this point in line 44, where things start to get a little bit interesting, here what we wanna do is, since this is gonna be a console window application, we're gonna pass in a path uh, where we have files stored. And I have several images that I downloaded off the internet, so I'm not gonna include these. I don't know what the copyright is on any of these, but I just downloaded some pictures of some wood. <laughs> I don't know. And then uh, I also have this little, uh, this little uh, Word document as well in a folder called C colon slash pics on my hard drive. So in order to let my application see that folder, I'm gonna have to pass that in as uh, a command line argument. And to do that, I went to uh, right clicked on the project name in the solution explorer, I go to the debug tab and fill in the command line arguments. This will now pass C colon slash picks into my application. It'll be retrieved right here as the directory path. Okay. Now what I want to do is iterate through that folder on my hard drive to find all the files and get a file list. 
And the next thing I'm going to do is start uploading those files to uh, my Azure blob. I'll make sure that uh, the user really wants to upload these. And then we'll start just looping through that list of files. We'll get uh, each file, open it as a file stream, and then we'll call get block, uh, block blob reference, passing in the file name of the local file, and then we'll call on that file reference upload from stream, passing in the file stream that we created here when we open up the file. And each time we upload one successfully, we'll just write that out to a console window. Now that we've uploaded all the files, we're going to make sure that the user wants to download all the files. So we kind of do everything in reverse. We go back to the container, say, give me a list of blobs, and we iterate through them. We make sure that we can actually access each of the blobs. And now we'll get a reference to that blob. We'll make sure that we know what the file name is so that we construct a new file name for uh, saving it locally. And here, notice that I'm appending the word downloaded to the file name. So whenever we see these, see this directory, c colon slash picks the next time, it should say wood3-download.jpg. And then finally, we're going to download and save the blob contents to a file. And then we will delete the blob from, uh, from our storage account. And then finally, we'll go ahead and get a list of all the blobs that are in the storage account. We should have none. Uh, and at that point, we'll be finished. So let's go ahead and run the application. And it pops it over here in my side window. Okay, so it finds four files in that C colon slash picks directory. It says, are you sure you want to upload these? I'll go ahead and select Y for yes. Looks like it uploaded them very quickly. It said it successfully uploaded the files. Next, we're going to download them all. So hit enter to continue. And so now we uh, downloaded each one of them and appended the word, uh, hopefully the word downloaded to each of them. And we did. So here's the original that I uploaded and here's the, uh, the version that I downloaded. Again, uploaded and then downloaded, uploaded and then downloaded and so on. Okay. So again, a very simple application. Just go ahead and uh, I, I don't go into too much detail on these sorts of things because I don't think you're going to memorize anything that I say in this video. All I really want you to have is a wor working mental model to understand the basic course of events. You're going to need to get a connection to storage account, get uh, a connection to a container or create one, and then you'll need to start working with the blobs and you're going to look at examples typically if you're like most developers uh, in order to do this because you only do this once you know, a week, a month, a year, whatever the case might be. But again, understanding that it's fairly simple to do it, number one, and number two, uh, the general basic course of events is the most important takeaway. Now for a more involved example, we can uh, take a look at uh, the quick starts, file new project, and then we go to install templates, Visual C Sharp Cloud Quick Starts, and here we can create an Azure Blob Storage Quick Start project and I've already done that and I've made no modifications to it whatsoever. Like most of the quick starts, what you're going to have to do is resolve some references because as you can see, um, first of all, the storage client is out of date and the configuration manager is out of date as well. So what we'll do is just right click and select manage NuGet packages. Uh, here it says some NuGet packages are missing. Click restore. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, and it finds a long list of things that need to be updated. Let's go ahead and click Update All. Accept the licenses. And we'll go ahead and click Close. And yeah, let's go ahead and reload everything that we've, uh, that we've got here. Okay, great. Now the next step is uh, to be aware of the fact that uh, this application needs a connection string and it's going to get it from a setting called storage connection string in our app config. So if we open that up and take a look, they've added a sample one for us. It uses the storage emulator. We've already talked about the storage emulator. So, uh, but at any rate, let's go ahead and walk through the code. Uh, essentially what we're going to do is a similar 
course of events to what I did in my project. I think mine's a little more simplified. This goes into more interesting uh, a scenario with uh, showing you how to do page blobs, uh, not just block blobs, all right? But essentially, we're going to upload this Hello World image to our storage account here beginning in line number 117. We'll get a list of all the blobs in the container. Then we'll download those blobs and you can see that they kind of add this word copy of. Uh, so you can see that uh, essentially it's exactly what I did with that dash download that I added to each of the file names and then they delete it. Notice they're also using the async version of some of these methods that I just used the, uh, the regular version of. Now that's uh, the first case, the basic storage block blob operation async here. The page blob example works a little bit differently. You start off basically the same with getting a connection to the storage count and uh, getting a, a connection to a container or creating it. But the next thing that you'll need to do after, uh, after that is actually create, create a page blob. We're going to make one that's large enough to handle two pages of data. And so a page is basically what we're calling um, uh, a byte array with 512 values inside of it. And each of those values will be a random number. Once we've filled up that byte array, then we're going to upload those bytes to our page blob. Then we're going to go about downloading our page blob. And the only thing that this demonstrates is how to use a continuation token. So this says that you can only download 5,000 blobs per segment, and a segment is made is basically what we were calling a page. However, in our example, we really don't need the continuation token because we don't have that many blobs. Uh, but essentially, we only have one blob, and we'll list it out here and what its type is and what its, uh, its uh, URI is. And then finally, we're going to read the data out of that blob. So we're going to download range to byte array, uh, grab all of those bytes from the page blob and download them and put them a byte array. And this is a good place for a breakpoint so we can see exactly what we download because the la last thing that happens is just it deletes the page block completely. So let's go ahead. Uh, first of all, we have to make sure that we have the emulator, the storage emulator running, which I do. I just started it up by going um, the, uh, the Windows S key to search for uh, storage emulator and I opened it up. It ran. It's going. And so now that I have that running, I'm gonna go ahead and hit run. You can see we hit the breakpoint, but before we did that, created the block blob sample just as we would uh, expect. But then also it starts working in the page blob sample and it lists the blobs in the container. There was only one blob, it was that sample page blob and it's of type microsoft.windowsazure.storage.blob.cloud page blob. Okay, so far so good. Now let's take a look and let's run this next line of code. This is what downloads the range of bytes to a byte array. And if we take a look, we can see each of the bytes in the val the random number that it, it stores. And we can just look through this entire listing from zero to 254. Oh, I'm sorry, to 511 probably. Yeah, 511, okay. So we're gonna grab all of the bytes from zero to uh, the number, the count, which is 512 items. And we can see how many bytes were read, 512 items, 512 bytes worth of information. And then we continue on to delete that page blob, okay. All right, so uh, those are two great base examples, how to work with uh, block blobs and page blobs. Uh, again, I don't really know that I would ever use page blobs, but the block blobs is pretty useful. Uh, so now that we've got the basics of how to upload and download and delete, things of that nature, let's move on to some more interesting examples. We'll do that beginning in the next module. Thank you. In this module, I'm going to demonstrate how to control access to containers and blobs programmatically. Uh, you'll recall from several modules ago, we could uh, set the security for a given container using a little drop down or the three options. There was private, which means only the owner of the uh, storage account could actually access that container and the blobs inside of it. The next step up was to make uh, was public blob, which made the blob itself visible 
but you could not get a listing of all blobs in a container. And then the third setting was the most open. You could read a list of blobs in the container and uh, perform operations on the blob itself. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at this code example that I've created. Uh, very simple. A lot of this you're going to recognize here. We're going to just get a container reference uh, and then start working with a blob. I'm going to pop up a little menu that asks, what would you like to do to uh, the specific container that we're going to work with here? Would you like to set it to a blob, public blob, public container, or private? And so then based on that, we're going to set the blob container permissions to a new instance of this blob container permissions object, setting its public access equal to a value from this uh, enumeration blob container public access type. We can set it to blob or container or off, which is the same as private, which is the default. And then since we have a reference to the container from earlier, like uh, right here, now we can set the permissions for that container to that blob container permission object that we just created and set uh, in the previous lines of code. Now, in order to make it interesting, we're going to upload a file. I've got a PNG file that I've been using throughout the series uh, in that hero versus robot example. We're just going to upload that and uh, to, to the container. And now what we're going to do is attempt to do two different things. Uh, we're going to try to download that blob and we're going to try and get a list of all the blobs inside of, of, the, uh, of the container. Now I'm using the URI of the blob in order to attempt to download it and to retrieve um, the list of blobs inside of a container. And I kind of note why I'm doing it this way is to simulate somebody other than the account owner attempting to work with the blob. We know that even if the uh, the permission is set to private or rather off, that the account owner can access it. So accessing it uh, using the uh, client library would be unfair. In order to make this really a, a true example, we're going to cr create the URI and attempt to access the blob from the URI and see if those permissions really do work. And we'll do the same here uh, with trying to access the the container note that there's this extra little bit that we're going to pass along as a query string that we're going actually we want to get a list of all the blobs inside of a container so i give some references here to constructing the uri and what those query strings mean so you'll definitely definitely want to check that out and some of the other options that you have when uh creating that uri that you can pass in and, and attempt to uh work with blobs in that in that manner all right, and then we just basically will either be able to display the list of blobs up uh, in the container or not, and we'll get uh, we'll get error messages or success messages based on both. So let's go ahead and run the application the first time. And the first time what I'm going to do is set that uh, set the permission policy to private, and then you can see we attempt to access the blob, and it says permission is denied to access the blob, and here's the error. It's a 404 not found. So Azure just says, well, I don't even know what that file is. Uh, it's probably the most secure way to go about this instead of saying, yeah, there's a file here, but we're not, gonna, we're not going to let you access it. Then there, there might be uh, some attempt to, to use nefarious means to access it. And so you can just avoid that altogether by saying, I don't even know what you're talking about. And the same thing is true with the second, although the, uh, it looks like the, it's kind of run together here, but the permission denied to access the list of blobs in the container. Here's the error. Okay, another 404. All right, so now let's run the example again. This time we're going to only use uh, uh, public blob access. So in this case, we've successfully received the blob with the response status OK. However, we're still getting a permission denied to access the list of blobs in the container. All right. So now let's run it a third time, and this time we're going to select the most generous of all permissions, uh, public container, and we get an OK status to receive the blob, and OK status to receive the list of blobs, and then I print out the list of blobs. It happens to be in an XML format, and I'm lazy and I don't format it, but you can see uh, each of the blobs. Here's the file name, soldier. It gives you the, uh, the last modified date the e tag, the 
content length, content type. Uh, let's see what else. And the lease status, that's interesting. We'll talk about leases uh, here in a little bit. And uh, at any rate, that's, uh, that's how you would programmatically set the permissions for a blob and for a container to be uh, the same as what you would do if you were setting it up in the Azure portal. Okay, so hopefully that's helpful and uh, we're going to continue on in the very next uh, module with uh, more interesting blob stuff. We'll see you there. Thank you. In this module, I'm going to demonstrate how to lease a blob so that you can update it and make sure that no other processes are updating the blob at the same time uh, to protect it from being corrupted or whatever the case might be. So when you put a lease or when you acquire a lease on a blob, you're basically putting a temporary lock on it in order to update it and that lock will uh, stay for a specific amount of time or until you release it. And during that time, no other write operations can be performed on it than the, than the one who's holding the lease. So I have two projects to demonstrate this. One is going to be uh, a, uh, an application that sets a lease or acquires a lease. And then the other one is just gonna try to write to the file no matter what, regardless of the lease. Uh, so either the, the first project, Blob lease will put a lease on it, write something to it, uh, and then release the lease. And then, uh, or we can run the blob lease test, which will just try to write no matter what. And we'll see that it'll fail when there's a lease on the blob. All right, so to get started, um, just to kind of uh, walk through some of, the, uh, some of the finer points, this is all the usual uh, connection to the container sort of code that you should be used to already. Here's uh, a way to get a reference to a blob. And now that we have that blob reference, we're going to attempt to acquire a lease for 45 seconds. And we're going to use this generate lease condition method to uh, actually, uh, later on when we attempt to write to this blob, from this application, we're going to need that access condition to actually write to it here. So now that we have the lease, we're going to open up the blob and we're going to attempt to write to it. If it doesn't already exist, then we're going to upload it. Here we're going to try to write to it and uh, obviously we're going to attempt to open it or write to it and we're going to pass it that access condition that, hey, we're the ones who hold the lease on it and then attempt to write some string. I think I've got the string right here, yeah. Just uh, basically a string that says from blob lease and then the current date time. And then when we're done, we can either release the lease programmatically or we can just let it run out uh, by itself. And we've set it to 45 seconds, so after 45 seconds that we acquire the lease, the lease would expire. So either way, we can tell it to release it or we can let it just expire on its own. And then in the test, it's pretty much the same code, except for the fact that we're just gonna to try to blindly write to it and not really even worry about leases, just to see what happens. So here's the situation. Let me, uh, let's take a look at the file as we get started. I've already got it up there. Um, and it's here, this example.txt, let's open it up. And you can see I've run this a couple of times already. Uh, it's going to either print out that this is a printout from the test application or from the leasing application. Let's go and close that. So let's first of all run the blob lease test and we'll see that it has no encumbrances as it attempts to write uh, to the blob. Let's open up our example again. And we can see that it added this statement here uh, at 1.25 in the afternoon. All right, great. Let's close that down. Now, let us acquire a lease. So let's run the application. And here we're going to hit enter to create a lease for 45 seconds. So we finished writing, but now let's attempt to run the blob lease test again and see what we get this time. We should, uh, since it's within 45 seconds, this lease should still be on the, uh, the blob, and it is, and we get this exception. Um, let's see if we can get, yeah, uh, storage exception, the remote server returned an error 412. There's currently a lease on the blob, and no lease ID was specified in the request, uh, and so it just errors out on us. All right, 
So now let's just wait in for about 30 seconds or so, and then I'll try to run this again. All right, and this time it says that it finished successfully. So we should see two new entries in this example.txt. The first one should be from the blob lease. It put a 45 second lease on it at this point. And then we attempted to run the test. At first it didn't work, but then the second time we ran it, um, looks like about 45 seconds later or so, uh, we were able to successfully write to it. All right, so that is all I really wanted to demonstrate with leasing a blob, updating it, and, uh, and disallowing any other processes to write to the blob during that time. All right, hopefully that was helpful. In this module, we're going to demonstrate how to use shared access signature to lock down blobs and containers on Azure. And so uh, this is basically called directly from two articles. You'll see uh, the URL for both of these. And you can read through and get some uh, a better understanding of how the, uh, the shared access signature works. Uh, I think you'll get a general sense of how it works as you watch the example that I'm about to demonstrate, uh, but then you can get more background information by reading these articles. But uh, in a nutshell, what we can do is create our blobs and our uh, containers in such a way that they can only be accessed when using a special URL, a URL that's been generated at the time uh, when those folders, or rather those uh, containers and blobs were actually created, giving permissions to some user outside of your organization that they can perform these tasks uh, for a limited period of time. And I gave some scenarios of why you might want to do this a couple of modules ago. Uh, but at any rate, uh, let's uh, talk through how this actually works. So I have, uh, and, and I pulled these examples almost directly from the articles that I just demonstrated. I made some small changes here and there to make things a little bit more obvious, at least in my mind. And hopefully by walking through this and having that background material, you'll have enough to get started if you want to implement this yourself. Uh, okay, so we have a solution with two projects. There is a uh, the client application, which is actually going to go out and try to do things like um, get a list of blobs in a container, write a blob to a container, read a blob from a container, uh, and things of that nature. So we're going to uh, we're going to provide hyperlinks for all of these scenarios. Here, I want to grab a um, get access to a container, and here I need to get access to that same container. Uh, but I plan eventually to use a um, with an access policy, and let me explain that in just a moment. The same thing is true with this text message, I'm sorry, this uh, text file and this text file. I'd like to be able to write them and read them uh, into the given container. However, when we run the application the first time, we're gonna get a bunch of error messages. In fact, none of these operations actually work because both the container that we're referencing and all the files that we're referencing um, have restricted permissions on them. Uh, we're not using the correct URL. Uh, when those containers were created, they were created using a shared access signature, and some of them were used, created a shared access signature with a policy. So what's the difference between just a shared access signature and a shared access signature with a policy? Uh, when you use the policy, you can also say not only does this uh, link expire in a certain amount of time to perform a given operation, but you can add the policy which says I'm going to allow you to read or write or list or delete or I'm going to give you no permissions whatsoever. And so let's take a look then at uh, this first project which is will actually generate these four hyperlinks that we'll come back to and we'll use uh, to demonstrate a working scenario. So let's go ahead and right click this and I'm going to select uh, set to start a project. And we'll take a look at the program.cs. And here what, what happens is, you can see at the very top, uh, what we're going to do is generate shared access signature URIs for all four of those uh, situations. Here we're going to generate one for the container and the blob. But here we're going to create a policy and then create new shared access signature URIs for the container and the blob. Now this is really the key here for the policy part. We're going to call this helper method create shared access policy. 
uh, and let's go to definition there and you can see that I have this important call out that says here are the permissions that we're going to allow on the container and or the blob as we apply this policy uh, we're going to allow read write and list this enumeration also has some other options like delete and none which are not applied now but I'll show you the scenario we'll come back and we'll add um, a permission and then regenerate it all all right so again the purpose of this uh, this is to create those shared access access signatures for those resources so I'm gonna go ahead and run the application and you're gonna see it generate four hyperlinks for us uh, with labels the container for just a shared access signature URI and for the container in the blob and then also for the container in the blob with an access policy so we have those URLs they're gonna be hard to copy off uh, from here in a, in a console window so I uh, some of the code here that I added, let's see, yeah, it will just write these to a simple file called sasinfo.txt. Uh, and so if you look in the this project folder on your hard drive in the bin directory, debug directory, there should be a sasinfo.txt. And this is exactly what we just saw in our console window a moment ago. So now what I need to do is like take this whole, uh, and there's four hyperlinks as you can see. So I'm going to copy this first one and I'm going to go over here to the client. I'm going to say instead of using that URL, use this new URL and that should get you a little bit further than previously. So I'm going to take a moment here and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to repeat this step a couple of times. Um, let's copy this one. All right, now let's take a look at these two helper methods that will actually attempt to uh, perform some operations on containers and blobs. So this first two operations, we're gonna test out the container. And we're gonna test out the container using the shared access signature and the shared access signature with the policy. And we're simply going to attempt to write a file to that container and then we're going to attempt to get a list of files in that container and will either be successful or unsuccessful depending on um, you know uh, whether we're using the right hyperlink or not furthermore we're going to do the same sort of thing with uh, testing out the blobs we're going to try to first of all um, write a blob or to a blob we're going to attempt to read the blob and then we'll attempt to delete the blob using both just a shared access, sig access signature and then the shared access signature with the policy. So let's run the application now and we'll get different results this time. Oh, whoops. Let's, uh, I, let's change this to the client. Let's right click, select, set a startup project and then rerun the application. That should work a little bit better. Okay, let's go to the top here. All right, so you can see this time the write and the list operation succeeded for just the shared ac access signature as well as the shared access signature with the policy. Both the write and the list operations performed uh, as we would expect. The, uh, in the second scenario with the blobs, the write and the read succeeded, but the delete failed. And the same is true for, uh, for that second uh, set of operations. The write and the read succeeded, but the delete failed. Okay, so now let's do this. Let's change around the permissions a little bit and then see if we can get the delete to work and the restrict uh, list just to, just for fun to see if we can make this happen. So what I'm going to do is remove list and I'm going to add delete like so. And so that should affect both of our tests. Now I'm going to need to rerun and get new hyperlinks for uh, for these uh, SAS's and SAS's with policies. I want to keep stumbling over that word. Uh, so let's set that as a startup project one more time. Let's generate a new set of URLs. Let's get rid of the old one. And let's get back and open up the new one. Shut that down. Let's look at this again. And so now we have a new set. I'm going to go ahead and copy these off one more time and put these into our client. So I'll do the rest of these off camera so I'm not wasting your time, but I'm just copying and pasting just like before. And I'm going to set the client as a startup project and then let's run it again.
Okay, so this time around, without the policy, we're able to do the list operation on the container, but with the policy, we eliminated listing as one of the available features for with using this hyperlink, and so you can see that the remote server returned an error whenever trying to list. Furthermore, when we go to the blobs themselves, the write and the read succeeded on uh, the shared access signature without policy, but the delete failed, which by default it uh, should not succeed because um, that's by default it, it shouldn't succeed. But then the write and the read and the delete succeeded because we added that to the shared access signature policy uh, whenever we uh, generated the new hyperlinks. Okay, hopefully that all makes sense. Uh, but that's how you can manipulate uh, the shared access signature using policy to shut down and restrict certain uh, features and functions. Uh, and let's go ahead and just refresh this. There should be two files left. There was a third file that was generated, but it was automatically deleted right away in that scenario. Um, the, the file that we were going to create was sasblobpolicy.txt. But again, since uh, we were successfully able to delete it, it's no longer in, in the blob. But you can open these up and look and see what it says. You know, it's nothing all that exciting. Uh, this blob was created with a shared access signature granting write permissions to the blob and so on. All right, so uh, I know that you're not gonna just come away as an expert using shared access signatures from just this video, uh, but hopefully this working code example will help you understand how these work and how you can apply them to your own situation. So hope that helps. We'll see you in the next lesson. Thank you.